I want to speak about the subject that universal history must not end in a tragedy. Uh, who wants to deny the fact that we are faced with the most dangerous moment in history ever? And let me say this forcefully from the beginning. This multifaceted, unprecedented crisis is entirely the result of wrong policies and therefore it can be corrected. That is, if the political will to do so exists. And to mobilize that political will is what this conference, which commemorates the 100th birthday of my late husband, Lyndon LaRouche, is all about. We face the acute danger of the strategic situation spinning out of control, leading to thermonuclear World War III, a situation which is more dangerous than at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And if it comes to that, would lead to the annihilation of mankind, a nuclear winter, and there would be not even a historian left to study the reasons why it occurred. And despite the fact that there is no question that that danger is very real, there are still some politicians talking that no scenario can be excluded. The tabloid Bild Zeitung today is bragging that the present Ukrainian offensive in Kharkiv is helped massively by NATO, armored vehicles from the US and Turkey, tanks from Poland, intelligence from NATO, the US altogether giving $10 billion in weapons to Ukraine. Well, are all these countries and NATO not already war party? So the question is, when is the red line crossed, crossed and when will we have a full-fledged war between Russia and NATO? Then, in addition, the financial system of the transatlantic world is hopelessly bankrupt. It's about to go through either a hyperinflationary blowout like Weimar Germany in 1923, only this time it would be not one country, but the entire so-called West, or we could experience very shortly ahead a chain reaction crash triggered by the belated increase of the interest rates through the central banks. The European Central Bank just increased 0.75%, uh, the highest in its history. Jerome Powell from the Fed evokes the, quote, pain of the Paul Volcker high interest rate policy, which at the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, was over 20%. If you impose that now in the completely uh, already bankrupt situation of many firms, over indebted firms, already capital flight out of the emerging markets. This could trigger a prolonged plunge into a dark age of every country dependent on the transatlantic financial system. And if we would have such a collapse, it would naturally increase the war danger instantly. We already have a world famine already now in danger are 1.7 billion people in danger of starvation. According to the United Nations, each day, 25,000 people die of hunger, completely unnecessarily. And obviously, if there would be a crash, it would lead to the death of hundreds of millions, if not billions of people. The pandemic is not defeated. New ones are looming for the same reason COVID-19 erupted because you have in a completely underdeveloped world, large parts of entire continents, you have the suppression of the immune system of you know, entire populations. In Europe and in Germany in particular, we are right now with the policies of the present government going to crash against the wall this winter. There will be mass bankruptcies, mass unemployment, emergencies, blackouts. Banks like JP Morgan Chase are already preparing to leave Germany to London in case of a blackout, which they expect, or other capitals. Now, officially, we have a strategic situation where the rules-based order of the democracies of the West are against the nefarious autocracies and dictatorships of Russia and China. In reality, the situation is mirror inverted. The countries of Asia 
led by the rise of China, the BRICS, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and much of the global south, because they are building a new economic system with the aim to overcome poverty and have real economic development. There is a revival, a renaissance of the Bandung spirit, the revival of the non-aligned movement. And what these countries are absolutely determined this time is to end colonialism for sure. The colonialism which officially does not exist, but which came along in new clothes. And they want to implement this time for sure the five principles of peaceful coexistence. Now let's take a look. What is actually the state of affairs in the so-called West? There is no democracy anymore. The possibility that the West could move towards a system of fascism with a democratic face was already discussed in the mid 70s by the trilateral commission and think tanks who openly discussed that in the case of an economic collapse, it could be necessary to impose such draconian austerity that one has to do away with the basic constitutional rights. Sam Samuel Huntington uh, of fame of the clash of civilizations, which was a blueprint for the North-South conflict to replace the East-West conflict, and the author of the horrible book, The Soldier and the State, which is an entire argument for mercenary armies to defend the empire, he wrote for the Trilateral Commission in 1975, The Crisis of Democracy, which was the idea that zero cause uh, would make it necessary to limit democracy, that if governments are too democratic, uh, then only a cataclysmic crisis would be sufficient to impose on the people the sacrifices which may be necessary. Well, that is the policy of Carl Schmitt, that sovereign is he who decides about the state of emergency. First picture. This brings us back to the point when Abba Lerner uh, was telling La Rouge in the famous debate in the Columbia University that if people had accepted Yalmach Schacht, Hitler would not have been necessary. Now, 47 years later, democracy, which you know a while ago one would assume includes the right for free speech, the democratic multitude of viewpoints <clears throat> could be exchanged, that idea is completely gone. There is no more knowable truth, which one can find out at least in approximation, for example, through Socratic dialogue. Instead, one can only accept the one narrative. And much of so-called politics going on these days is the absolute attempt to have a dictatorial control over that narrative. Now, part of that narrative is that the Ukraine war was the result of, quote, an unprovoked Russian aggression. Even um, the mentioning that history didn't start on February 23, uh, even if you say that there was a history before that, makes you a Putin agent a follower or proponent of Russian propaganda. And if you propose to try to end the war as soon as possible, which is what the opinion is also of leading military experts, such as, for example, the German former General Kujat, former General Inspector of the Bundeswehr and head of the Military Commission of NATO, a very high position, says that in a recent article that the war cannot be won by either side that the sanctions may cause irreversible damage to the German economy, that our freedom was neither defended at the Hindu Kush, nor is it defended in Ukraine right now, that this escalation risks the uh, escalation to a nuclear war. All of these are obviously very good reasons to negotiate a peace settlement. And if you say all of that, you are being put on a death list on Ukrainian websites, which are financed by the US State Department. Now, obviously, that is real democracy. And European governments part participate regularly in meetings of these Ukrainian institutions, 
which run these web websites, such as the Ukrainian Center to counter disinformation. You have right now in most of the West European and U American countries, Britain for sure, a Gleichhaltung, a lockstep in the mainstream media, which makes Goebbels turn pale because of envy. You have an atmosphere of McCarthyism. You have a digitalized Gestapo. And during the last months, dozens of people told me privately that they are afraid to speak their mind, even in private circles, because otherwise they fear to be ostracized. And I want to save this for the record. We don't need Russian analysis to come to our conclusions. We have an international private news service, Executive Intelligence Review, which was created by Lyndon LaRouche in 1974. And the NSC Senior Director of International Economic Affairs, Norman Bailey, in 1984, in the position as a White, as a White House advisor of the Reagan administration, told us that he considered EIR the best private intelligence service uh, of the world. And more importantly, uh, we are not gathering intelligence by reading newspaper clips, but by advocating our own policies. And then we evaluate the reactions and come to, to the conclusions and analyze what that means. We know the prehistory of the 23rd of February because we are part of it. Even before the Berlin Wall came down, LaRouche had forecasted the collapse of the Soviet Union absolutely correctly in 1984, where he said that if the Soviet Union would continue their then existing policies of rejecting the cooperation with Reagan on the SDI, of sticking to the Orgakov plan, then they would collapse in five years. And that is exactly what happened. So we basically put out uh, the uh, answer to that, the productive triangle, Paris, Berlin, Vienna. And when the Soviet Union collapsed, we uh, proposed to connect Europe and Asia through economic development corridors. And we called that the Eurasian land bridge. And it was our idea of a peace order for the 21st century. Uh, please show the picture of the Eurasian land bridge, which then became the world land bridge, uh, which is still uh, our present policies. Now, it would have been in the self-interest of all countries to realize that proposal. We know that it was rejected for geopolitical reasons by Thatcher, Bush Sr., and Mitterrand, because at that point, it was the policy of these countries to have the former superpower Soviet Union turn into a Russia, which would just be degraded to be a raw material exporting third world country. And <clears throat> this was the idea in 91 to eliminate a potential competitor on the world market, because it was considered that Russia would have more educated scientists and more raw materials. So if you would allow economic development, um, you know, it would become uh, stronger uh, than uh, the United States uh, at that time. But despite the fact that this policy was rejected at that time, we kept organizing for the Eurasian land bridge on five continents. We made hundreds of conferences and seminars and from that standpoint, experienced and observed, observed firsthand how the historic chance of 1989, please show the picture, was lost. And we published a book about that. And how the promises not to expand NATO to the East were broken. We observed firsthand by organizing for the Productive Triangle and the Eurasian Land Bridge in the Yeltsin years, how the uh, shock therapy uh, reduced the industrial potential from 91 to 94 to only 30 percent. And the intention to ruin Russia was already there. Uh, and, you know, Yeltsin was the willing instrument of such policies. Now, after Putin came to power, the policies of color revolutions were implemented 
Orange Revolution in Ukraine 2004, Rose Revolution in Georgia, White Revolution attempted in Russia, Yellow Revolution attempted in Hong Kong against China. In 99, Blair instigated the policy of the right to protect, which was the idea to replace the Peace of Westphalia order and the UN Charter with the rules-based order to give the basis for interventionist wars in Southwest Asia and Libya. No, we are not repeating Russian propaganda. We are attempting to give history a better direction and we saw who supported this proposal and who opposed it. And most importantly, we are not the flat earth people. We have a different method of thinking which relates to the real physical universe of ideas, not on opinions based on sense perception. And that's why we cannot be nudged, the term of Cass Sunstein, into be believing what is the allowed narrative. I said in the beginning, we have the worst crisis in history as the result of wrong policies and therefore they can be corrected. Now, LaRouche forecasted in 1971, and this is probably the most important forecast ever made in history, that when Nixon introduced the floating exchange rates and cut the dollar uh, from the gold standard, if the countries would continue with these monetarist policies, it would lead to a new depression, fascism, and a new world war, or we would have to have a completely new economic system. Now, this was 51 years ago, and LaRouche made, in the meantime, nine major forecasts and many, many more at each branching point. When the Trilateral, Trilateral, Trilateral Commission introduced the controlled disintegration of the world economy, and the authors of that all became then members of the Carter administration, this was the evil idea to never allow the emergence of mercantilist economies in the developing sector. Never allow, an, quote, another Japan in the southern hemisphere, meaning that Japan, after being undeveloped for many centuries, then in the Meiji, uh, Meiji uh, administration, uh, Meiji restoration, suddenly made an industrial revolution in a few years you know, which obviously could be replicated by every developing countries. That was supposed to be outlawed. That was followed by the Volcker high interest rate policy, brutal austerity policy, Reaganomics, Thatcherism, mergers and acquisitions, outsourcing to cheap labor markets, just-in-time production, shareholder value society, going public of middle-level industries, market deregulation, derivative speculation, quantitative easing, negative interest rate, etc., etc. At each step, LaRouche not only made a brilliant analysis, but presented policy initiatives. Please show a couple of pictures illustrating what I'm saying now. He proposed the IDB in 1975, which was the idea to replace the IMF with a development bank which would allow the massive development of the developing sector. He proposed to, together and for uh, President Lopez Portillo Operation Juarez in 1992. He proposed the Strategic Defense Initiative which was implemented by President Reagan on the 23rd of March in 1983. We developed in all of this time programs for Africa, Latin America, Eurasia, Middle East, US. And LaRouche always <coughs> was working on uh, the idea that to avoid, to plunge into a prolonged dark age, uh, one had to get the institutions to reject and overturn the wrong assumptions of monetarism. What is involved here is a fundamental difference in the methodology of thinking. If one looks at the long arc of universal history, mankind has made an enormous progress. From the hunter and gatherer society where the population did not surpass 10 million people on the planet, 
alone during the last 10,000 years, there was an enormous population growth to about 8 billion people today. We see that in that history, a recurring phenomena. Actual leaps forward occurred through Renaissance periods. Exemplary, I can name the classical Greece, the Abbasid dynasty, the Song dynasty in China, the Italian Renaissance, the German classical period. All of these are high phases of history and they were always catalyzed by a relatively small number of individuals who contributed original discoveries as the result of adequate hypothesis in science and art, leading to new levels of understanding concerning valid principles of the physical universe. So far, each time these upturns were subsequently interrupted by the enemies of progress, who were able to induce society from the leading layers down to the credulous majority of the population to adopt views which ignored the realm of ideas just discovered and replaced them with ideologies suiting, suiting the interest of those enemies, i.e. the ruling oligarchy. The secret, why La Rouge has been the most successful forecaster of economic and social tendencies, and all his critics have been utter failures, lies in the fact that he acquired throughout his life an unparalleled knowledge of those ideas, which over the course of millennia led to the qualitative advancement of human history. And those ideas, who would fold the universe down to from what Gauss would call later the complex domain, to a reductionist Euclidean conception of things and events. Plato describes that difference to the paradox uh, of the cave, where the real world of ideas exists outside of the cave, while those people who rely on their biological sense perceptual apparatus only perceive reality as shadows, as if upon the walls of a dimly firelit cave. A crucial example of that difference is highlighted by the paradoxes in geometry that do not allow reductionist solutions such as the construction of the five platonic solids and the doubling of the line, the square, and the cube. It is these paradoxes which laid the foundation in thinking for a whole class of thinkers who were thinking and subsequently making discoveries in the realm of the complex domain and the platonic tradition, such as Brunelleschi, Nicolaus of Kuhs, Pacioli, Leonardo da Vinci, Kepler, Gilbert, Fermat, Huygens, Leibniz, Bernoulli, Kästner, Gauss, Lazar, Cano, Dirichlet and Riemann, and naturally Einstein and Vernadsky. All progress in human history has come from that tradition. La Rouge has demonstrated in numerous treaties. On the contrary, the ideology, ideology, the ideologues of the reductionist tradition have done absolutely nothing to contribute but a lot to obscure the insight into real knowledge, such as the Aristotelian tradition of Descartes, Newton, remember his famous hypothesis non fingo, you don't need hypothesis, or I don't assume a process hypothesis, Boyle, Euler, Lagrange, Laplace, Cauchy, Clausius, Grassmann, Helmholtz, Maxwell, Lindemann, Felix Klein, Bertrand Russell, and the student of those. The same is essentially true for ideas in art, where you have the fundamental axiomatic difference in the classical art aimed at the elevation of the creative power of the audience and those forms of art which dwell on the banalizing or even worse, brutalizing the senses, the preferred method of the oligarchy for the control of the population. In this respect, there is no difference between the Roman Empire making the audiences of the amphitheater complicit in the killing of the gladiator, where the audience have to put thumbs up or down to decide if the gladiator dies or, or lives, and the cult of violence portrayed in the entertainment industry of today. La Rouge had a profound knowledge about the different axiomatic outlook of these opposite traditions, 
and provided ample proof that the physical universe does not follow the pathway of Euclidean geometry, such in, please show the graph, the difference between the shortest distance, but <clears throat> the, uh, the actual principle of the Leibnizian uh, least action. In the same way, the physical economy cannot be described adequately by mathematic uh, and statistical methods. Developed, uh, and he developed his whole, Darush developed his whole economic scientific method explicitly with a polemic against information theory and the systems analysis of Norbert Wiener and John von Neumann. Or algorithms don't fit the real economy neither. But only by the methods of a Riemannian space time of general relativity. It is only that thinking in terms of the complex domain which can conceptualize the impact of a never ending series of discoveries of qualitative new principles of the physical universe, which each defines an entirely new economic platform where the newly discovered principle redefines the relative productivity of each aspect of the entire economy. Out of that methodological approach, LaRouche arrived at the unique concept of relative potential population density and the related concept of energy flux density in the production process, both of which must continuously increase per square kilometer and per capita because of the relative finite character of resources at each level of development. At each level, the cost of development of the resources tends to increase and thus lower the productivity of labor. With the stagnation of the technological level, the effort and cost to maintain the same number of people increases and the relative potential population density decreases. But the conclusion of that fact which, as LaRouche concludes, is exactly the opposite of what the Evil Club of Rome concluded in its oligarchical propaganda pamphlet, Limits to Growth. Namely, that from now on, one needs zero growth and even negative growth, uh, and, you know, that there are, uh, and LaRouche wrote against that, please show the picture, no, there are no limits to growth. In which Lin wrote one of his, one with which Lin wrote one of his most important books, uh, and demonstrated that continuous scientific and te technological progress are necessary, and that higher degrees of anti-entropy are arrived by the continuous application of human creativity, and this is corresponding to the laws of the real physical universe, and this is therefore the precondition for the durable survival of humanity. The relative population potential in primitive society was approximately 0 0.06 to 0 0.1 persons per square kilometer. And the total potential of the, of the world did not exceed 10 million. Today, with 8 billion people, there are more than two orders of magnitude more. And with the commercial use of fusion technology within reach, and the existing technologies to produce essentially limitless amounts of new fresh and clean water, the population potential can double and beyond in a very short period of time and create a living standard for each human being comparable to the average family living in Switzerland today. Show the <coughs> slide on energy flux density. From solar and wind energy with a very low energy flux density to fossil fuels to nuclear energy, this measurement increased from 0.2 kilowatt per square mile uh, to 70,000 kilowatt per square mile and has the potential to increase to 10 to the power of 15 with the second generation of fusion power. In light of this, reality, the exit from nuclear energy in Germany and the EU policies of the Green Deal not only means the end of Germany as an industrial state, and that is the intention of the Greens, it also means the reduction of the relative potential pop population density of the world because the productive capacity of the fourth largest economy of the world, 
Germany will be subtracted, and this will lead absolutely to an increase of famine, epidemic, and social unrest. And that is the intention of the Malthusian oligarchy as well. LaRouche knew all the essential representatives of the two opposing outlooks, and he made it absolutely transparent for anybody who wanted to know why the elimination of creativity and the potential for genius was so absolutely essential for the oligarchical class, for whom the evil Malthus was only a paid scribbler. So it was clear that the common denominator between the outlook of the British East India Company, the controlled disintegration uh, <clears throat> of the world economy of the Trilateral Commission, the great transformation of Hans-Joachim Schellenhuber and the great reset of the World Economic Forum is the same reductionist, empiricist, Malthusian ideology. When China recognized its error that the assumption of limited resources of the planet was wrong, they changed the one-child policy because they recognized that each additional child would contribute the potential of new creative discoveries and they emphasized from there on the continuous need for innovation in the economy. Thus, the Chinese economy made a miracle which did not suffer, suffer economic cycles because the continued increase in productivity did eliminate the reasons for that. So the rise of China is the result of a correct economic policy which echoes the theory of LaRouche and the United States and Europe are collapsing because they prefer Malthus over LaRouche. So the crisis in the West is entirely self-inflicted and not the result of evil policies of Russia or China. The BRICS countries, the SCO, which have their big uh, summit on the 15th and 16th of September, so just in a few days from now, in the ancient Silk Road city of Samarkand, in Uzbekistan, many organizations of the Global South working on a new world economic order, reviving the tradition of the Donaldite movement, all of these are aiming to end colonialism, overcome poverty and underdevelopment. And the Belt and Road Initiative, the Global Def uh, Development Initiative, and the Global Security Initiative, which are proposed by China, these are all concepts to overcome the geopolitical confrontation and create a platform for a shared future of mankind. The United States and Europe, rather than trying to contain these developments, should rethink the reasons why we are in the mess we are. And we should join with these countries in a new paradigm of international relations based on the five principles of peaceful coexistence and the UN Charter. We are not only going into a hot autumn and winter, but what in all likelihood will be the collapse of the entire system. This is why the Schiller Institute has put the need for a new paradigm, a new security and development architecture on the table. So with Friedrich Schiller, we can say man is greater than his destiny, provided however, if we follow the advice of Lopez Portillo and listen to the wise words of Lyndon LaRouche. Thank you.